Um, I'm here to welcome you to the SCI forum tonight. Um, I'm a rehabilitation psychologist in the Department of Rehabilitation Medicine at University of Washington, and I'm the director of the um, spinal cord injury model system here at UW. Um, the forums uh, and the video recordings uh, and our online media content are all made possible by a grant from the National Institute on Disability and Rehabilitation Research, and we're grateful for that funding. Tonight, we're very pleased to uh, welcome Dr. Jennifer Hastings, who is the director of the School of Physical Therapy at the University of Puget Sound and an expert in the area of wheelchair seating. Her presentation tonight is titled, Tips for Choosing the Right Wheelchair. After Dr. Hastings' presentation, we'll open uh, things up for the audience to ask questions. So welcome, Dr. Hastings. <laughs> Tips for choosing the right wheelchair, here we go. First off, you have to be systematic, okay? So you shouldn't just go online and see the coolest thing. You shouldn't buy into all the marketing. You have to have a system, and the system that I'm going to suggest is on this slide. Okay? Now, I'm going to walk you through this, but the most important thing is right uh, there, okay? a physical examination. I think there's a whole lot of getting wheelchairs, getting wheelchair equipment, getting cushions, getting backrests without a physical exam, and I'm going to try to explain to you why that's a really bad idea. The thing that it says on the bottom in the yellow is a functional assessment. We're going to walk through that too, but it's basically what does the equipment need to do, all right? And then we will take you through the next steps, but I'm also going to recommend trials as really important, okay? Because if you don't try a wheelchair out, you don't really know what you're getting. And then the other part is that chair has to be set up correctly, okay? Because it's not really a trial if it's set up for somebody entirely different size, shape, and uh, physical ability than you, okay? So that's another piece. I know that it's a challenging piece. I know it's a challenging piece. I know timelines are part of the problem. So let's start with that functional assessment. What does the wheelchair have to do? Sounds like a stupid question. It's like, well, I can't walk anymore, so that's what my wheelchair is doing. But you know, there's more than that. Maybe there's poor endurance. That might be a reason why you need power or power assist, okay, or ultralight. And then there's the paralyzed trunk. Too little attention to the paralyzed trunk. There's a huge difference having stability in your trunk or not in terms of what you can and can't do, in terms of how you push the chair, in terms of what the chair has to do for you, okay? So that's an important one, and we'll walk through it. So what you're basically doing is you're figuring out what that chair has to do for you, and what the chair has to do for you basically is support the right posture and then support the things you need to do functionally, okay? So posture, what the chair has to do, and I'm going to spend more time on this later, but the chair and the way it's shaped, configured, has to help you sit in the best posture you can, particularly in the presence of a paralyzed trunk, okay? And the only way you know how to set that chair up is by doing that physical examination, and we're going to talk about that. The functional needs are a little bit easier and also more patient-specific. The postural support, meaning the orthotic support that the wheelchair does, there is some pretty specific rules about that based on your physical exam, how you're going to set the chair up, okay? They're pretty specific, and I'll get there. Function is way more individual, okay? So it has to do with these parameters. How much time do you spend in the wheelchair, okay? What environment do you live in? Are you in Seattle or Montana, right? Are you in an urban area or a rural area, okay? How are you for wheelchair skills? I'm going to go out on a limb and say more recently, more people have lesser wheelchair skills, okay? So if you can't masterfully use your wheelchair in your environment, meaning wheelies, opening doors for yourself, going up curbs, that sort of thing, then you're going to be more challenged in what used to be considered not such an aggressive environment, okay? So that matters as well. Ability to do self-care, are you going to get dressed in your wheelchair, okay? 
Um, a therapist, a common therapist mistake is to put an aftermarket solid backrest on a chair for somebody who's been using a wheelchair for a very long time and the therapist forgets to find out whether the person dresses in their chair. If they dress in their chair, they're going to tend to arc over the backrest and if that backrest is now solid and a little higher, you've just made them not able to pull up and down pants. Okay, which is sort of a big deal and usually is why that equipment will fail. Okay, so thinking about what people do in the chair and what their abilities are. Let's uh, expand that a little. Can the individual who uses the wheelchair transfer? Okay, at all or really, really easily? At all means they won't have any help and maybe they'll get into the chair once or maybe they'll transfer out of the chair into their driver's vehicle, you know, the van seat, but the rest of the day they're in the chair. The person who transfers easily, they're going to hop out of the chair to watch TV, out of the chair to watch a movie, maybe out of the chair to eat at a restaurant, okay? That's an entirely different need for what the chair provides, right? Okay? So one can be a real minimal chair, all right? And the other has to provide more things. The other issue is how much assistance they might need from a caregiver. And if a caregiver has to do help for that transfer, the chair has to be set up thinking about ease for the caregiver. Okay, you gotta, you gotta build that in a little bit, all right? So if the time in the wheelchair is super limited because they can transfer a lot, uh, the chair can be minimal. If they're gonna be in it all day, now we need more comfort. We need pressure relief. We need some more supports that we might not have in the chair otherwise. Okay, so you're sort of following the idea of what does the chair have to do? We haven't even looked at what's out there on the market yet. We're at the very first two boxes on that form. Okay, now I talked a little bit about the environment, but let's expand that a little. If you're going to use the wheelchair only indoor level environments, which is where we test them frequently when we're trying them out in somebody's clinic or hospital floor, right? If that's where you are, then you can specify, you can think about all the parts for minimal roll resistance, okay? But if you're going to use it on rough terrain, cross gravel as your daily driver, if your chair is your mobility device and, you don't ha and you're using public transportation, now you need to be thinking about shock absorption, right? You need to be thinking about durability. You need to be thinking about longevity of a battery if it's a um, power chair, okay? So you have to think about, again, how is this chair used for the individual? Again, I talked about wheelchair skills a little bit already, but propulsion skills is part of this too, okay? If you can lift your casters, if you know how to lighten your casters so that a little threshold or a little bump or a change in carpet density doesn't interfere with you, that's going to be, again, an entirely different person for what you can specify in that chair than somebody who cannot do that, who needs to have, you know, larger casters to track over um, things like thresholds and cracks in the sidewalk, okay? So, so it's going to matter. And then, again, for power and manual equipment, but more for power, safety, judgment, those kinds of things matter. The ability for self-care, I talked about that picking up the pants and getting dressed um, in power chairs and also in manual chairs, but self-cathing, okay? Uh, not just getting pants on, but what position do people need to get into um, manage bladder is huge. And that matters whether they're cathing or whether they're draining a leg bag, okay? Most of the time, the individual needs to shift forward, bring, bring their butt forward a little bit in order to create a pelvic tilt a little bit, in order to get some more stability and some space, okay? If you over-shorten things um, because of lightweight or because of posture thinking, you might interfere with this very, very important function of bladder um, management, okay? So we have to think about that one in ADL as well, okay? ADL also has wheelchair height, okay? So what are you doing? What are you doing throughout the day? 
How, what is the clearance that your knees need to go under? Okay. Um, what environment are you in? Are you going to school? Are you going to work? Are you going to work where you only have one workstation and you can get it modified to suit your needs? Or are you a mobile employee who's going in and out of a number of environments where the tables are going to usually be more closer to standard and you might want to be able to get under those? Okay, so this is what I mean when I say ADL, work as well. Transportation, um, another mistake that's made by a lot of therapists, upgrading long-term users' chairs, is to forget to find out where that chair goes in their car, okay? Years and years and years ago, um, when we were trying to get everybody into the rigid frame chairs, there were a number, I had a number of fails because the individuals could not fathom stowing the wheelchair into the car the way that it's necessary by taking wheels off and stuff. It seemed too hard. Didn't matter that the chair was 30 pounds lighter. It still seemed too hard, okay? So there are some things that long-term users um, have, that they, they just, n a habit they're not gonna change, or sometimes a space. Remember a car is, I mean, wheelchairs are pretty darn expensive, but cars are more expensive. So the vehicle that the person already owns probably needs to be respected in terms of how is your chair going to fit in there, okay? The other issue is if uh, the individual is going to ride in the chair to drive, uh, strongly, strongly recommend against this, okay? Strongly recommend against it. It is uh, true that the tie-down systems hold the chairs. It is not true that anything on your chair is stress-tested at, at an accident level. So everything that's bolted on by a therapist or a vendor or something else, you know, is a give point in an accident and that makes it highly dangerous. It is way better to transfer into a vehicle seat and drive from there for your safety. But then I will also say, if you can't transfer and yet you can drive, driving's more important and that's a choice that I respect you might decide to make. Okay, because it's a huge for your independence, and I understand that. But in terms of specifying a chair, we need to figure out what's going on um, with how that person's riding in a vehicle and how we should be setting it up. Maintenance matters too. If you live in an urban area and you have multiple people that can potentially maintain your chair or get you parts, that's one thing. But if we're talking about Montana, way up in Alaska, okay, or even... Well, actually, in eastern Washington, you're pretty good because we have some of one of our manufacturers over there. But uh, there are places where you're going to have a hard time getting equipment, okay? Another thing you might want to think about is also where is the manufacturer versus where you live in terms of replacement parts and even communication with the therapist and the user. So if you have a three-hour um, time differential, if you're down to two different pieces of equipment, and one is local in your time zone, not necessarily next door, but in your time zone, and one is not, you may want to think about that when you're figuring out um, the final decision, okay? All right, now, most of what I talked about is sort of spinal cord specific so far, but remember, spinal cord injury comes kind of at all times in life, and some of these other things might already be going on, okay? Or they might get added to your spinal cord injury over time. I, I'm here to tell you memory and age doesn't matter whether anything else is going on. So cognitive abilities unfortunately decline as we age a little bit. You could also get something like a stroke or another neurologic condition or you might have had it ahead of time. Okay? Um, we, we like to believe that spinal cord injury, uh, most people with spinal cord injury are cognitively intact. Right? We really like to believe that, but you know what? A lot of force caused that injury and your head got shook around, okay? And you remember the shaken baby syndrome? You know, I mean, you know all about these other things that are not you that probably mean a little head injury. I realize that in us, we don't want to talk about it, but there's a likelihood that you're not 100% in the brain capacities, okay? We have a ton of functional reserve, which means we can compensate, and that's how come most of you feel like you're fine, okay? And you're probably acting fine. But when you get a little older, those little conks to the head start showing up too, <laughs> okay? So just to know. But cardiac, pulmonary, if you've been a smoker, okay, or are now, these things matter too. Visual perception matters, particularly in a power chair, okay? So again, these are all issues that as you're thinking about what chair somebody should get, you need to think about. 
Now, so what we've done on that schematic, there were two yellow boxes. One said physical exam, and we haven't really done that yet. And the other said functional exam. That's what we've done. I'm going to go back to the, fun the physical exam a little bit more. But basically, you're then going to come up with a list of what equipment will meet all your needs. Okay? And you, you start there. You start there instead of the equipment that's out there that you saw that was cool. You, what, need, what meets my needs? And then you start there. And I'm going to really strongly recommend simple before complex. The main reason there is the more things, the more weight, the more possible breakage. Okay? So that's, again, that's kind of my priority. <coughs> okay, now we're going to get to the posture and the physical part. So this is my baby, this is my research area, this is what I think is probably missing in most of um, what we do, we as the spinal cord injury professionals, about musculoskeletal pain in spinal cord injury, about chronic pain in spinal cord injury that is not neurogenic. I think most of this is postural, or at least a huge amount of it that we can intervene on is based in the posture. So I think that the seating and how you set your chair up matters for your posture, and so I think it's really, really important that you have a postural evaluation. Now, that means getting out of your chair. That means out of your chair, on a firm surface mat, with a therapist with a tape measure and a goniometer. Everybody, goniometer, I mean, I know that's a big technical term, but you all have been through rehab, right? That ridiculous name for the, thing, the piece of plastic that swings back and forth, right? It measures angles. Okay? You need, the therapist and you need to understand the limitations, P-R-O-M, if you're pregnant means premature rupture of membranes, but if you're not pregnant and your spinal cord injured, it means passive range of motion. Okay? And that means how far can your limbs move when they are passively moved. And why it matters is your chair is going to be a static system, right? And if your body doesn't move freely into the angles set up by your chair, we're going to have some problems. Okay. So a postural evaluation looks like this. This is the process. The individual, you, are sitting in something, even a hospital chair or something, okay? And I, the therapist, am going to look at what you look like in that chair. And I'm going to look through some particular points, sort of systematically. I'm going to look at your shoulders. I'm going to look at your hips. I'm going to look at where your legs are. I'm going to look at your sternum. I'm not going to walk you through everything I'm going to look at, but I'm doing a very objective observation. What I'm trying to find out is how are you sitting, right, in that chair. Then I'm going to pull you out of that chair because that chair is holding you up, at least to some extent, right? I'm going to pull you out of that chair, and I'm going to look at what you look like now, and what I'm doing is I'm comparing these two things, and that's telling me what was that chair doing to you, okay? Did you look better in whatever you came in in, or do you look better without it? I got to tell you, a whole bunch of times you look better without it, which means the chair itself is creating postural problems, okay? Then you go supine. Supine means laying down flat on your back. Flat on your back, I'm taking your limbs, your legs primarily, but to some extent your arms, and definitely your trunk, and finding out how it moves, how flexible it is. What I'm doing now is comparing those two, and that's telling me if I took gravity out of the picture, can I get you straight, right? If I put you on a stretching machine, grabbed your feet and grabbed your shoulders and stretched, can I get you straight? Or are you bent? Maybe because your original fusion was not put in completely straight, or maybe because you uh, broke a uh, femur and the range of motion's not the same there and it's stuck, okay? So there might be some things that I'm going to find that are fixed or not flexible. Then while you're out of the chair, I'm going to take that tape measure and my goniometer and I'm going to measure all of the parameters of the wheelchair. This is all the angles. What's the angle between the seat and the back? How long is the seat depth? What's the rear seat to floor, front seat to floor? Angles, okay? What am I looking for as I'm looking for 
do your angles, do the motion that your body can do, and the angles in the chair match? Do, they, do you fit? Can you even fit in the angles that are prescribed? Or are they setting up some instabilities that I can predict? Okay? So I'm comparing your mobility with the chair. So that's basically what a postural eval is. I tell you that and I walk you through it because if you have not had one, then you have not had a seating evaluation, even if you've paid for one. <laughs> okay? That's what it is supposed to be. And if somebody just says, oh, I think you should try an X, you need this before you try that X. Okay? That's part of what we should do. Now, seating is therapy. So all the ther is there any therapist in this room? Right. Okay, so the therapist in this room, it is therapy. A lot of therapists abdicate seating to a service department at a, me a durable medical vendor. So you go, I think this backrest needs to be adjusted. Go take it to so-and-so and have them adjust it up. You basically prescribed a therapeutic intervention and you didn't follow up on it and you didn't assess whether you were right. Okay. So a number of other interventions that you can think of you would never do without immediate assessment, okay? And I think we need to take back our responsibility. Now I'm going to walk you through one. I know part of the problem is we think we can't get paid for it, but you actually can. All right, now here's an example of a gentleman who has C8 spinal cord injury, okay? And I will admit this is not the same day, okay? In fact, on the right, he's in definitive equipment, and in the, even though he's wearing the same shirt, <laughs> it is not the same day. On the, your left is the day that I evaluated him, okay? Contacted me for shoulder pain. His shoulder pain went away. His neck pain went away. I'm going to suggest he looks a whole heck of a lot better. His wife thought he lost weight, okay? Didn't lose a pound, but yes, looks like it, okay? And that is a really important outcome. Okay, it's a very important outcome to look better. I don't need to tell anybody in this room it's challenging to be disabled and cruising around in a wheelchair. It is not the most socially acceptable, you know, person out there, right? I mean, you're not, you have to be strong to go out every day and notice that so-and-so's talking to, you know, your companion instead of you and assert through that, and I know that. Now also, look worse, right? Look worse. So looking better, looking sharp is important. It's a valid outcome. So what is a seating intervention? A seating intervention is this. Any specification or modification of a wheelchair configuration or the user interface. The user interface means what you're actually touching. So the cushion under you, the backrest behind you, it's the user interface, okay? for the purpose of improving the user's health, comfort, function, or well-being, right? Looks isn't under well-being in my opinion, okay? I am all over it's okay to just look better and that's the only outcome I got, all right? Now, posture matters. Posture matters a lot. Now, the fellow on the left here, whoop, all right, whatever. The guy in the orange shirt sitting next to the young ladies. It's a young lady in a white shirt showing us good posture, right? Just happens to be there looking all perky. The person in the chair is sitting in very expensive equipment, all right? Most of you recognize that. We will not name the companies, but those are very expensive wheels. It's a titanium chair that's very expensive with an aftermarket backrest on it as well top-of-the-line equipment and horrendous posture, horrendous posture. That is a tetraplegic patient, I don't, or individual, I don't know this person because he's in a new mobility ad, okay? But I can tell by his arms that he's tetraplegic, and because it's 2003, he's tetraplegic. The fellow on the right is a quadriplegic because I rehabbed him in 89. Okay, and, and he's C6 quadriplegic, and he has um, no trunk muscles either, and that is a whole lot different 
looking posture, okay? Now, I want to talk a little bit about skin because skin is really important and where I started in, in sort of um, the advertised talk was pressure mapping. So that's where I started with my talk and then I've sort of taken it every place else. But skin and spinal cord injury. Now what happens? You have a spinal cord injury and this, this, gray, this set of gray boxes happens, okay? The first one says immobility. You can't move as well, okay? You can't move as well. Atrophy means every place where you don't have functional muscles, where the muscles aren't innervated anymore, those muscles are getting smaller. They physically shrink. They actually get smaller in size. Am I telling anybody something you are surprised to find out? Probably not. But nonetheless, that's what it is. Trophic changes is a little bit more technical. This is more about your skin, okay, and all your tissues. It basically just means not as healthy, not as lubricated, not as good as tensile strength, not as not as, not as, okay? So for the skin, we are not as lubricated, not as, uh, your sensory organs aren't there either. We have all kinds of problems going on in the skin, okay? Thermoregulation, big word for temperature control, okay? Temperature control, you lose some temperature control with spinal cord injury depending on your level of injury, right? For the most part, that's going to, for skin, matter when you get hot, okay? And, and if, particularly if there's moisture in the area. Now, this would not be sweat because that's what's lost, and the evaporative sweating is lost, okay? So all of these things, moisture where it doesn't belong, less muscle tissue so that the bone is closer to the surface, weaker skin, okay? This sets up less tolerance for sitting and for friction, et cetera, okay? And then these two things are actually what set up more pressure. The fact that you can't move as well and the fact that your bones are closer to the surface, okay? So you add those two together and you can get skin breakdown or at least the potential for it, much higher than without, okay? So in comes pressure mapping. What is pressure mapping for? What does it do? But what a pressure mapping system is, is a, uh, a very flat sensor that you put under your body or whatever you're worried about the pressure on but, and on top of the cushion or whatever you're sitting on. So it's between you and whatever surface you're wondering how much pressure there is, okay? It is an interface measurer. So interface means like this, the pressure between those two points. It doesn't measure in the other planes, so it doesn't measure shear, okay? And it doesn't measure tissue perfusion. Tissue perfusion means is there blood getting to the area, and why we care about blood is because blood carries oxygen and takes away waste products. So is there getting oxygenation to the tissue? Pressure map doesn't tell us that. Okay, does not tell us that. It is a interface pressure sensor, okay? So, and it doesn't measure those shears either, said that. Now, there's a correlation between increased pressure and pressure ulcers. Correlation means association. It means people who have more pressures, there's an association between that and pressure ulcers. We are not clear that there's a causation, okay? And I say that because there's got to be something else because there are people with very high pressures and no pressure ulcers or sores, okay? However, we're pretty sure that it's one of the factors, okay? And that maybe those people that have high pressures and no sores have some sort of protective thing as opposed to the other people, um, you know, missing, well, I guess missing and having protective is the same, whatever. Pressure mapping is a tool. It's not the thing. It's not the answer. It's one of the tools that you probably want to put in your seating assessment, okay? Now, that said, a lot of times there's not going to be one available 
and that doesn't mean you can't change anything, okay? Because CD pressure mapping systems are pretty expensive and they're not all over the place. Um, so I, I don't want you to think that you have to continue, the, be afraid of changing your seeding because nobody can map your pressures, okay? If you use a pressure map in combination with everything else I've been telling you, in my opinion, this is what it does. If I've narrowed it down, if I've gotten down to a couple of different cushions that meet, or wheelchair configurations, equipment, that meet all of my clients' needs, everything that they need to do, and are giving me the posture that they need, then I'm picking between those two, and I want the one with the better map, okay? Because it's just that thing that lets me say, well, these two, sort of all parts being equal, I'll go this way. Or again, if I was looking at another equation, all parts being equal, I might take the local person. All parts being equal, I might take the one that costs less money, right? I mean, so, but you have to get to that equal part first, and then this is a de uh, decider. Now, there's a few things that I want to point out. All right, this is a pressure map. Pressure maps have these output screens that give you, for the most part, colors, okay? And some of you in, oh, various magazines, New Mobility magazines, some of the others, you've seen some of the vendors, some of the cushion manufacturers will display a pressure map, okay? And this is part of their advertisement, okay? I'm going to submit to you, do not be suckered or impressed or fooled or anything by that. Because a pressure map standing alone is pretty useless information, okay? So this is, I'd say, not a bad map. It's not a bad map. But you know what I don't know? I don't know the scale, okay? I don't have the scale for the sensors. Now, the top of the scale is 200 millimeter, uh, mil, uh, yeah, millimeters of mercury like when you p pump up your blood pressure cuff, okay? And the top of the pressure mapping scale is 200. When you do a blood pressure on somebody, you normally pump that cuff up to about 200 and then start letting it down. Over 180 is the way that they teach people. So this is not a bad map. Yellow is not so bad. Red is bad. But this is a map and this is 10 minutes later. I'll just let you sit here while we chat about other things. So it's important to also know when was that map taken? What did it look like later? Now I also want you to know that this is the wound that was present at the time of this map. Okay? So again, pressure mapping is not sufficient. It doesn't take the place of skin inspections. It doesn't take the place of an evaluation you also can't generalize. So you can't look at that advertisement and go, oh, somebody's butt looked good on that cushion. Okay, so mine will. Okay, because in truth, you're individual, you're individual in your pelvis size, individual in the amount of atrophy, in your range of motion, in your weight, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so you can't do that. It's comparative. It's appropriate to compare different cushions or configurations on the same day. In my opinion, not even over time with the same patient, okay? And you have to be sure that the calibration is the same on the, and the scale is the same. So again, now this one shows you the scale over here, okay? And so if you're looking at the scale, you can compare maps on the same day of the same patient and say, wow, you know, of these, if everything was equal, I definitely like that far right corner one because the rest of them look like they've got more pressure, right? Okay. However, position matters too. Position matters huge, okay? This is the same individual on the same cushion on the same day in different positions, okay? And these are literally not tilting the chair and untilting the chair, anything like that. This is a little tug behind the knees and putting them back where the therapist thought they should be. All right? Now, I will submit to you that when the mat looks that different with a small positional change, you might want to be someplace else too because most patients can't maintain their posture that tightly, right? So that they're not going to show up on that one down there. This map 
Did anybody notice why it might look hotter than the other ones? I gave you the legend. What's that? It's 100. It's half of the other legend. Okay. So I would expect to see a lot more. So really, this top left one, or maybe even all of them at 200, would look fine. The reason I lowered this was because I had a very fragile skin, a uh, uh, person who'd already had multiple breakdowns that we didn't want to open up again, and we were thinking about changing her position, and we wanted to see where we, was it going to be a risk, okay? All right, also a dynamic assessment will be very helpful. So some of the systems are wireless. You can put the map between you. You can go out and do things like, you know, jump off curbs and, and do pushing and things and see whether or not maybe the problem is something about how you're pushing or how you're moving when you're pushing. That's really nice. But at the very least, if you're going to bother to pressure map, you should simulate motion, even if you don't have a wireless one. So somebody should be reaching to the ground. They should be doing their pressure release. They should be pretending to push the chair so that they're moving their seated surface as if they were, um, you know, really moving. Okay. Now you can also use the pressure maps to teach people the best the best pressure relief. All right. So I mean, I can go. Okay, let's see if you can get enough relief by leaning to the side or by leaning forward. Um, there is good evidence that for most people, a forward lean and not even not dropping your chest to your knees, but just a forward lean on like elbows across your thighs is the best ischial pressure relief that we can do. It almost always clears people's ish totally, and it's way easier than a lift, okay, and way better for your shoulders too. So just a little FYI. But beware, a beautiful map, a beautiful map doesn't negate the need for pressure release. Okay, you still have to move around. Okay, because why? Because we don't know whether pressure, pressure is associated with pressure ulcers. It, we don't know that it's the cause. Okay, all right. Um, so when I do pressure mapping, I want to do it before and after an intervention. And what I mean by intervention is a wheelchair seating change. Doesn't matter whether it's going to be a cushion or a backrest angle. Okay. So my preference is to do the map then, and what I'm trying to do is not make baseline any worse, okay? That's what I'm trying to do, assuming that baseline has been okay, right? So if they're coming to me with a wound, that's different than they're coming to me because I got a little back pain or I want to get a new wheelchair because, okay? All right, so we're back to this. So again, this is spinal cord injury and it happens. All this stuff happens. This pressure intolerance happens, but posture basically affects these things, okay? And it affects, how does it affect immobility, okay? Let me tell you about that. You can be sitting in too stable of a posture. If you're too stable, it's really hard for you to move and you're not going to move with enough excursion to change your pressures. So you have to be in sort of, uh, depending on, the, the fewer muscles that you have under your disposal that you can use, the more, I know this is going to sound weird, but the more unstable you have to be, right? Because then you can, your little bitty muscles can actually move your body. Whereas if I put you in a super stable position, your limited motor ability is going to be basically limited to, you know, driving with your joystick. stick, okay? So you need to be thinking that way too. All right. So pressure mediates the outcomes. It's just another slide sort of saying the same thing. I talked about pressure distribution already. Upper extremity biomechanics don't have time to talk about that very much right now. But the shoulder is attached here to your rib cage. The scapula is free across your back. It is obligatory to your spine, okay? So if you're sitting in bad spinal posture, by definition, your upper extremity is in bad mechanical use, okay? By definition, okay? So good posture is a prerequisite to moving your arms around. Now, if you weren't disabled and before you were disabled, if you ever went to a physical therapist in the last decade, they talked to you about core, okay? Because that is what all the physical therapists in the world are working on is strengthening people's core. What that means is your stability across your abs so that you have good posture, so that you can have good mechanics in all the rest of your movements, okay? So in spinal cord injury, that's every bit as important, but we don't have abdominals to work with. So we have to think about other ways to get our posture. 
Uh, respiratory function is on this list. Posture matters for respiratory function. How upright you are literally is your vital capacity. If you get too closed, you don't get as much air exchange. Air matters because it's, it's oxygen, and oxygen gets to the tissues, and it's tissue health. All right, so some of my early work was looking at the paralyzed trunk and trying to figure out, well, what can I do about it? Because if I need to do something with the wheelchair to make people sit better, what can I do? And what I was able to show was that an acute, so 90 degrees is a right, tri a right angle. Acute means tighter than 90. Obtuse or reclined or open means wider than 90. So if the seat to backrest is 90, acute is less than 90 is what we needed to create better posture. So we needed a less than 90 angle at the seat to backrest and a positive seat slope. And a positive seat slope means the front of the seat slope, the front of the seat is higher than the butt of the seat. Okay? So that was um, work that I published in 2003. And then um, my dissertation looked at could I then really change somebody's musculoskeletal pain, somebody's pain, by changing their wheelchair, and yes, I can. Okay, so what I was able to show is that there was a real association between musculoskeletal pain, even in long-term wheelchair users, and in fact, sometimes more so in long-term wheelchair users, and their posture, and that we could fix it, or at least make it better, by changes in their chair. So what does that all mean? Okay, most of you were in some sort of orthotic device after breaking your spine. Paras were in a TLSO, right, that kept you from being able to bend, and the points of control were here, here, and then there, holding you from flexion. Some of you were lucky enough to have it extend across here. A few probably had halos that really wouldn't let you move at all. But except for ones where they screw into your bones, orthotics work by what's called three-point system. Two points resisting one direction and then at the axis of rotation on the other side. Okay, so that's what we need. And in the um, fellow sitting over here, that's what I'm doing with the chairs, okay? So I'll explain a little bit more. It comes up later on how we do that. But the main thing is, if your body can't move completely into that range that I just said you had to have between the seat and backrest angle, then it, it makes a problem instead of a correction to stuff you in there, okay? which is taking us back to that Madival and why it's so important to do that. So if there are range of motion deficits, if there are problems, and in spinal cord injury, heterotopic ossification, does anybody have it in the room or has anybody heard about it? H-O, sometimes you only know the nicknames. It's bone where it doesn't belong and in spinal cord injury, often in the front of the hip, blocking hip flexion. It happens in traumatic brain injury as well, and I have a slide case that's actually traumatic brain injury instead of spinal cord injury, but that's to show you. Okay. The concept is we want to optimize our postural alignment because it decreases the work of just sitting there. That's how you decrease the musculoskeletal pain. This is true for able-bodied people as well standing here. You notice that I'm standing as about straight as I can. If I were to try to, you know, do the whole lecture like this, first off, I would not succeed very long. I mean, already my quads are going, you're not thinking about holding this very long. If I went like this, I'd have neck pain in a heartbeat, okay? So alignment to decrease muscular work against gravity is the concept, okay? And then the other thing, and this is really important for spinal cord injury, you have limits of stability, but let me show you how that works in standing. I can reach to here, no problem. I can reach a little further if I compensate by sticking my butt up. But if I really need to touch that, I'm going to have to step. That's the limit of my stability, okay? So in setting up a wheelchair with a paralyzed trunk, you don't expect to be able to reach both hands away from your body like this. If you can, you're sitting too stable. If you can put both of your hands away from your body like that without just falling over, you're sitting in a position that you shouldn't be all day long. You're sitting in a bad postural position. Now you're thinking, well, but I have to do this. Well, I'm going to argue, no, you don't. 
What you need to do is you need to reach with one hand and stabilize with the other. And for those moments in time, like calfing, that you really need both hands to be able to function away from your chest, you need to slide your butt forward and get in that more stable position for the temporary time that you need it and then get back out of it so that you're in good alignment to, for musculoskeletal health the rest of the time. Okay, um, the last thing here is the way that you should be sitting in your wheelchair should be best for pushing your wheelchair, should be best for breathing and pushing your wheelchair, okay? And, and we compromise only for the people who absolutely can't get out of their wheelchair, and our best bet is to have positional change, which basically means some sort of changing ability in the chair, um, rather than having them sit in just one posture all day if they can't get in and out. Okay, so how do we set these angles up? All right, well, first off, it's very, very important that you set the chair and the angles up based on orthotic concepts. So let me kind of show you what I mean. Bice also, you can't forget the cushion and the backrest and anything else you're sticking on. But if you start with the stuff you're sticking on instead of the frame of the angles, you're chasing your tail, okay? You need to start with the angles of the chair and ma making sure that those match the anatomy and then go from there. So, key is gonna be your backrest angle, room for your thoracic curve, what does that mean? This is my lumbar curve here. And if you see where my hands are, there's back above it and that way. Okay, so if you go straight up from your lumbar, you're not allowing room for what is a normal thoracic curve, okay? Normal curves are curves, and the thorax should be a little bit back. Um, proper seat depth, angle, knee angle, and foot support, and I'm gonna show you what this means. I'm also gonna show you the relative position in space. There are some misunderstandings about that seat slope, okay? Many of people think that the slope is to keep your butt back. It's not. It's part of this relative tilt in space that allows us to harness gravity. If I lean forward just a little bit like this, gravity which is coming straight down is on this side of my axis of rotation and I have to hold my head up against it, okay? What I want and why I stand like this is I put gravity here basically helping me stand upright. Okay? And what you want in a wheelchair is the same thing. You want to harness gravity to help with trunk extension. Okay? Not have to fight it with muscle strength. So this is a computer simulation of that. And the fellow on the left is a classic. This is a, actually Jamie Thompson's work. And he was saying, you, can't, you have to sit this way. And he was advocating a 5 to 10 degrees recline in the backrest. And I had a conversation with him and I said, I think you're wrong. I think that we can get the stability by our backrest angle. And so the one on the right is what I do, is bringing the backrest back acute. And what you end up doing is you get your center of mass and the line of gravity going like this. And, and basically, all of a sudden, you're stable. Okay? He was suggesting his basic, his big argument was that um, this is the best you can do on the left. And you had to, had to, had to run with anti tippers because people were going to be unstable to the rear. And so my argument with him was not so much about the postural alignment, but also that there's not instability to the rear if you're up and over your um, pelvis because you're, you're not rearward, okay? So when there's truncal paralysis, we have to set the wheelchair configuration up to stabilize the pelvis and allow normal curves, okay? What that means is the backrest is at least... Um, the backrest is going to be stopping your pelvis from rocking back, which is the same thing as hip extension. Basically, your pelvis rocking back is opening up this hip angle. The backrest stops that, okay? The seat slope, having the slope come up, is to make your pelvis not rock forward. Now, not everybody can do this, but those of you who can, play along. If you're sitting in a standard chair, I want you to sit on the front edge of it, and if you're in a wheelchair and you can do it, go ahead. If you're in the front edge of your chair, okay, all able-bodied people, please now put your pelvis as anterior as you can get it. So hold it in an arc. Really give us a lumbar lordosis, right? Nice anterior tilt. Ready? Feel like you got it? Now you got to hold on to it there, okay? Ready? 
Now, take your right foot and put it over your left knee, but don't change that tilt. It's not possible, okay? So what you're doing by bringing the seat slope up is you're bringing your thigh forward just like that so that now what we're doing is we're limiting this anterior motion of the pelvis and basically we're stabilizing the pelvis from the rear by the backrest, from the front by the slope. It is not to keep you not sliding forward. It's literally to keep you not doing this, pitching forward, okay? It's three points of control. Okay, now, this is sort of what it looks like, okay? That's sort of what it looks like. It's a combination, and the other thing that it does, remember if I have, this is my lumbar support here, my lumbar curve. I said look above, and you'll notice that I have back above my hand. Well, look what I have below my hand and that way. My butt, okay, or the sacrum, which is basically like this. We need to allow that curve too, so you have to have room for the sacrum posterior of your lumbar support, okay? When you have the sacrum posterior, then lumbar support, and then thorax posterior, you're going to have as close to normal spinal curves as you can get. All right. If you're putting um, the chair, you know, if you want a rule of thumb, this is it. This is from my work that I published in, 20, in 2003. Basically, a starting point for the slope. Now, slope is a ratio. This is the other mistake you hear all the time. This is from users. I've got a four-inch dump. Okay. Four-inch dump is meaningless information. It doesn't tell me anything because slope is a ratio. It's a fraction. It's rise over run. It would be just like saying, you know, on my ramp, you know, I got a four-foot ramp, right? Well, which way, right? I mean, so because if it was four feet this way, you're not going to get up it at all, right? So, again, this is rise over run. The difference is the rise between the front seat height and the rear seat height, and the run is the seat depth, okay? Or, therapist, depending on your company, usually the frame length. So if you, if you lengthen the frame, that's the company's denominator. So you, this is where we get mistakes, where somebody's been sitting beautifully and they get a brand new chair and they think, well, we'll just nudge the frame a little longer, and all of a sudden they don't seem to be sitting very well anymore. It's because you just took that slope that was like this and you flattened it, because the denominator got longer, okay? So it's a ratio. 0.25 for a paralyzed trunk, that's a starting place. That's a 16-inch seat depth, okay, with a 4-inch difference, okay? 0.12 or 0.8 for the innervated trunk. So your L1, um, your amputee, they don't want to be on a dead flat seat either because if you put them on a dead flat seat, none of these chairs you notice for the able-bodied people are dead flat, right? You don't want to sit on a horizontal surface. So even with intact musculature, you want a little bit of a cant. But for paralyzed, we need more, okay? Uh, all right, so this is the backrest concept. It needs to be low enough and at the right angle or contoured. So if you go with a higher backrest, you just have to remember what you're doing and contour it. So, oops, that's, can you see that red? Just barely. There's a faint, skinny red line drawn on there. Do you see that? And it kicks backward. So aftermarket backrests, you need to put them higher and the top goes back because that's for the thorax and the bottom comes forward because that's your lumbar support. Okay? Ergonomic seats. Ergonomic seats are, um, let me know what they are. I bring this up because, because they're out there and people have asked me about them. The ergo seat is that flat at the back of the seat and then it pitches up, okay? And a number of the companies are having them as an option in their chairs and everybody thinks this is a great idea. And the concept is the cushions do that, right? They have that little butt well in the back and then they come forward we'll just do it on the chair. The problem is if you have a paralyzed trunk, okay, they don't tilt in space. So they don't do that harnessing gravity thing, and so they don't work. Um, so that you need to have at least five degrees of rearward tilt to make a paralyzed trunk stable. So 
I'm getting close to summary here. Seating is done after a postural evaluation. You're trying to support normal spinal alignment. That helps with your motor control. It's the angles that matter, okay? Um, the angles of the wheelchair itself and then the cushions and the backrest. And mobility and health is maximized with optimal seating. And you think I'm done, but I'm not. So we're going to fly through a couple because I want to show you some examples, all right? So key. Key is the thigh length, the real thigh length, okay? This, okay, is how I should be sitting, not this, right? If I rock my pelvis back and then I measure, it's going to be a lot longer, okay? So that measure matters a lot. Hamstring length. Hamstring length matters because if you pull your foot rest forward, you're going to be pulling on your hamstrings. Why that matters is this little bone that we're also fond of, which is the ischial bone, the hamstrings attach to it. So if my hamstrings are tight and I pull my foot forward, my pelvis goes with it, okay? Hip extension, nobody gets this. The hip, hip flexors are tight, they're on the front. Why should that matter? I'm sitting, right? Well, the reason it matters is because you're also paralyzed. So you're sitting and you don't have anything else pulling back. So what happens is when you get tight in the hip flexors, it pulls your spine forward. You're going to feel like you're going to fall over unless you slide your butt forward or really arc hard, which you'll see mostly in um, populations like spinal bifida and CP. All right. So I'm going to slide forward a minute. Sagittal plane is this one. Okay. It matters. Just believe me. Okay. Here you go. We're ready to do some problem solving. All right. Here you go. Now, right at the top, I call this conflicts. So you're to find the things, I already taught you how to do a seating eval, what is the problem? Anybody? So yes, compared, so this number and th those two numbers, which I put right next to each other conveniently, seem to be disparate, okay? Now the footrest angle and this other stuff, it's a little harder because what happens is you're rocking around in space. But look, this is same chair. There's not one piece of equipment different. It's just adjusted. Okay. Now, I shorten the seat depth. There's a base wedge to try to close the angle because this particular chair doesn't have that adjustment. Okay. And then bringing the footrest back. So I want you to look at the two. Now remember I said sagittal plane first, just trust me? That's what I corrected here, sagittal plane. I didn't do anything to the front, and yet look at what happened, okay? So that's just measuring and then making the measurements fit. This is the one that I told you about already, HO. I'm telling you the problem already. HO, okay? HO happens in spinal cord injury as well, and you need to make sure you're paying attention to your range of motion because it can be late onset. Basically, this fellow whose, whose mother he lived with and his mother at this point in time was 74, and they'd gotten to the point where he was falling out of the chair to the front so many times um, that they were having to call 911 because his mother could never get him up anymore, okay? Now, I'm telling you the problems HO, just, but just look for a minute. This old chair, it's an old quickie, that's a 90 degree weld, okay, at the backrest, which means that his hip should flex at least to 90, okay, and it doesn't. So basically this is the fix, okay, and again, I changed the footrest, but otherwise I'm using the same chair and just adjusting it. I did add a wedge, but this time the wedge, instead of making it more acute, is going the other way. So what I did is I put the wedge like that, okay? And then I rocked the chair a little bit in space so he wouldn't fall. And I followed him for two years and he never fell out of the chair again, okay? So, and look at how much com more comfortable he looks in the front. So again, this is just, this is that physical exam thing that I was talking about, all right? Prevention science, so what I just showed you were indicated seating. People look horrible, it is indicated that we should fix it, okay? 
But prevention and health promotion is way better. Way better. That's what we should be doing it right at the beginning. So this is the take-home points now. We're getting there. Big is worse for posture. Okay? If you have wiggle room, if you have too long of a seat depth, it's going to put you into a posterior pelvic tilt, and that's bad. Everything cascades negatively from there. If it's too wide and you can slide yourself over, now you're building a scoliosis, that's a problem too. Okay? So, anybody whose therapist or dealer says, well, you might gain a little bit of weight, tell, you know, walk away. You know, you need that chair small. Therapist, don't let them gain weight. We, can, we need to not gain weight in America. We got a problem that way. All right? So we need to not a plan on bigger. We need to get ourselves under control, and we need to be smaller for posture. Too big of a backrest angle will always set up posterior tilt and set up bad posture as well, too. So we have to watch these angles. Decision tree. Okay, so should I go with a longer frame? Is there a benefit to a longer frame? Well, there's more stability in a longer frame. Now, we're not talking about too long a seat depth, notice. We're talking about the frame. Because the seat depth can still fit the patient. So if the feet de uh, uh, seat depth fits the body, a longer frame means I'm sitting more inside my chair instead of sort of upon it. Okay? It means the frame will probably come forward of your legs and give some leg containment instead of being behind your legs and giving a little bit more you to the world instead of wheelchair. So it's kind of a what you decide you want. One is being more in, the other is being more on. Okay? Transfer handle. So some people really like to have a part of their frame up there that they can grab hold of and that helps them transfer. For other people, that transfer handle is a transfer obstacle and they get their legs all trapped and they can no longer transfer. So the functionality matters individually on which way you're going to go. Anytime you go bigger, it's going to be heavier, okay? A longer frame has a longer turning radius, so you better be thinking about that. If you are lengthening a frame on somebody who's had a long-term chair, remember you need to change, fix your slope equation, right? If you are lengthening something that fits just barely in, for instance, a car, you better be measuring that. You better check, okay? All right, now, what adjustments do you need? Okay, because this was the question from the advisory group. What should we do about how do we get a chair early on that's also going to be good for me later? All right, well, any chair, you have to be able to change the center of gravity after you own it, okay? Particularly if it's your first chair. Because chances are you don't have the skills that you need to survive, and hopefully you're going to pick them up. And when you do, we're going to increase the dynamicness of your chair by moving the center of gravity. Center of gravity is how far forward of the backrest frame is your axle. Okay, that's what center of gravity is. The inside seat to back angle, you want adjustable on any chair. Okay? Folding chairs, it's a little harder to get, but you still want it. Backrest height and footrest height, you're always going to have those adjustable because that's going to be if you want to change your cushion, right? So you always need to have those changed. Now, Here's where I'm going to say the first compromise comes in. Posture is really important. I already said that. I think posture is the most important thing except for function. Okay? So if I can't get you transferring out of the seat slope that makes you look absolutely beautiful, then I'm going to compromise that slope for a little while until your transfers get better because they will so long as you can do them, and they absolutely won't if you can't do them, right? So if I leave you with a marginal transfer, I can guarantee you're not going to get better at them. If I instead compromise a little and get the transfer doable so that now you can do more, your mastery will get better, and then I can titrate back in the better posture. Okay, everybody with me there? Important point. Also, do you at the bottom? Some of us are actually incomplete. If we're incomplete, we really, really, really want to be able to adjust that seat slope because too much slope is a bad thing if you have real trunk. 
All right, axle height. If you're going to adjust the slope, you have to be able to adjust the axle height. That means you have to be able to adjust the caster housing that mean, and the backrest. Now you've just got a lot of stuff. So the problem with that is all these things add weight, add breakage, et cetera, but they're all needed. So if you think you're going to have to have an adjustable slope, know that you need all of these. Okay? Really almost done. First compromise, if you're going to adjust that slope, that's a cantilever chair. Cantilever chairs don't have an underframe. ZRA is one. Um, okay, so they look like that, the old Kushal. If you, tilt, if you decide to change the slope, this is what happens. The foot rests in space change. Okay, and people are not happy about that. Okay, so you need to make sure that you're thinking about this and the backrest thing. Push arc also changes. Push arc is really, really, really important. If you lower somebody into their wheels or bring them back up out of their wheels, now we have a big problem with our push mechanic, okay? Any added parts add weight and breakage. Footrests. I think if there is a real potential for standing, walking, or significant weight bearing during the transfers is the only reason to consider getting removable footrests. At this point in time, I'm going to tell you that power chair is different. But at this point in time for a, a manual chair, you probably want to keep your footrests on because they're an integral part of keeping that chair light and strong. All right, last thing. When do you need an expert? If you have new, the key things here are new. If you have new skin problems, if you have pain when you're pushing the chair, if you have new posture problems, if you have new instability, or and this is probably <laughs> true of too many people, you've never been comfortable, able, and stable in your chair, okay? How do you find an expert? I am remiss, I didn't get back to the slide, so I forgot to put the occupational therapist. Occupational therapists are often very good at seating as well, particularly power wheelchairs. Um, but there's American Physical Therapy Association, and then there's RESNA, and on both of these places, they have a find a PT or a find a PTA. There's my email at the bottom. So the question is different styles of cushions. And I think what he wants is, you know, what can one say about them? Okay. So there are different technologies in cushions. So the air cushions by design are pressure distributing cushions that are for the most part not intended to be postural support. However, the air cushions contour um, across a configured chair really nicely. So in one way, if you have a really well configured chair, an air cushion is great. If you've got really high risk skin and you need to put a cushion under yourself in say a car, that air, the, the flexibility of it to contour to the seat of the car is really beneficial. The um, foam and gel cushions um, as a philosophy are trying to be pressure distributive but postural supportive. So their job is to hold you in a postural position and that's their, um, that's, and then distribute the pressure but holding you in a postural position. So if you think about somebody with a marginal transfer skill, that cushion that holds you in a postural position might just be the thing that makes you not possible to transfer. On the other hand, those are firmer bases, and so the firm base sometimes allows people to transfer who might not be otherwise able to if the base was a little too slithery, okay? So it's really individualistic. Um, there are, um, so most of the cushions on the market and the cushions that have been on the market for the longest time are all pressure distribution cushions, okay? They're not trying to completely eliminate it, they're just trying to distribute it over the best amount, okay? And a, um, an air cushion is mostly an immersion concept where you're supposed to sink into it and be wrapped, like you're wrapping yourself in water in a bathtub, okay? There's another philosophy, which is the offloading, okay? And offloading means you're taking an area like the ish that you consider to be a high-risk area and completely taking all pressure off of it, which means it's being suspended. So it's being suspended and the only way you can completely offload that is by onloading other tissue, okay? Um, the theory is actually behind an amputee socket 
So when uh, an individual has an amputation and then you use a prosthetic leg, they were uh, loading, offloading the distal residual limb because that's a high risk skin breakdown, loading certain parts that were um, tolerant of um, pressure. The problem uh, is we uh, do not necessarily know that that model, the, the amputee model, makes sense for uh, uh, spinal cord injury bottom. Okay, there's, a, there's sort of a difference in what you are, and also position. Yeah, okay, the question was, can you talk about is there a difference, and correct me if I get it wrong, um, is there a difference between uh, if you've been, you been injured for a while and maybe developed some contractures and also have been habitual, already using a system for a while versus if you're getting set up for the first time, okay? Um, in terms of the concepts, there's no difference. But in terms of the reality, that longer term person, you have to deal with potential loss of range of motion that you then have to accommodate. The most important thing is that I don't try to stretch you with a wheelchair. That if you're tight somewhere, I accommodate that in the seating so that I can allow the spine and everything else to sit in the best posture. It also um, is true, my, my habit would be if somebody's skin has been healthy with no skin breakdowns, I am very hesitant. I'll change their posture alignment, but I'm very hesitant to change their skin interface, so meaning their cushion. I will try really hard to not move away from the same cushion technology if the skin's been good. Um, and that's because we really still don't know enough about skin. I mean, like I said, everything's an association. We're not quite sure what our cause is. And if your skin's been doing well, why rock the boat? Because skin breakdown is not a happy place to be. Okay? Now, contraction, now, that doesn't mean, and I, I will say, um, gosh, in 1996, I wrote a paper um, which actually looked like it was about rotator cuff tears. But it was a, in the back of the article, there was some seating information. And, and there were cases that we did at that time. And the average was um, like 20 years out of their spinal cord injury. And one was 47 years out. And we made changes that made a difference in their musculoskeletal pain and in their posture and in their seating comfort. And so my message there is it's never, it's just like smoking. It's never too late to fix it. I mean, you, it's just because just you've been a long time some way doesn't mean we can't make it better, and almost always we can. So, um, and some, by the way, OT, the change on one of those people was to get them a, shower, uh, a bath bench. To get a bath bench instead of letting them transfer to the tub. Guy only took a bath um, three days a week, but transferring to the bottom of the tub three days a week was enough to chronically kind of re-injure his shoulder, and he'd never ever, and then once we got him level transfers, that went away. The question is, would you recommend a seating evaluation over some certain interval, okay? Let me answer that twofold. First, uh, I can wear shoes for a really long time and pretty soon they're really, really, really comfortable and then when I get a new pair of exactly the same shoes that I really used to like, turns out they're, you know, one of them's not comfortable, right? So we do sort of slide into slop and get comfortable with it. So I think that it's still probably a good idea even if you feel like you're sitting well to sometimes get it checked, but here would be my threshold. My threshold would be um, your equipment probably should be um, replaced when it's starting to show wear anyway. When you're starting to get breakage of the equipment, that's probably a good enough frequency if you don't have the other thing. So if you have pain with pushing, have new skin breakdown, your posture is changing and you notice it, your posture is changing and your you know, significant other notices it. Something like that, that till any of those, the threshold is low. If something is new is going on, I'd get in to see a seating person, okay? If it's just, you know, wonder if I should get checked, probably concurrent with your equipment. But that said, cushions, I would like everybody to do a better job on their cushions. Wheelchairs, there's some soft parts of your wheelchair that you ought to pay the most attention to because the hard parts are getting stronger and stronger. If you got good equipment at the beginning, your frame can maybe last you forever, okay? But the upholstery, the screw-on parts, the wheel locks, okay? If you've been replacing those things, like on the third time, it's probably time to have a seating eval, okay? Because the soft stuff should remind you. Cushions, here's what I want you to start doing. You get a brand new cushion, 
I want you to weigh it. And I want you to record the weight. I want you to measure it. Measure how high it is, measure all of it. So weight and measurement, okay? And then this digital age, a nice digital photograph, okay? And then every so often, weigh your cushion, look at that photograph. If your cushion is significantly lighter and it's foam or gel based or significantly heavier, either way, and lighter if it's rubber based, if it's lighter or heavier, it needs to be replaced, okay? It's breaking down. If it's heavier, it's probably collecting fluids maybe a couple of different times that you didn't know about and you don't want them, okay? So um, heavier or lighter or changing that measurement, get a new one. The, okay, the question is how many uh, appointments with a therapist would one have for an adequate seating evaluation and trials to figure out the best equipment that they should get if it's a long-term user getting new? Thing number one, it depends on whether that long-term user is very happy and comfortable in their chair. So if they believe that they are stable, able, and comfortable in their chair, then there's not as much to do, okay? And if they're also accurate, so their skin is good, you look at them, right? All that. <laughs> one appointment on the mat one appointment is to do the full MAT evaluation and that functional evaluation, and you don't do trials that time at all. Because the problem is you're doing the trials, you didn't take enough synthesis of that first information. So what you want to do is you want that patient to come in, and you want that thorough MAT evaluation and that thorough functional evaluation, a lot of that's interview, and then from there you synthesize it and you write a list. Here is the appropriate equipment. Here's what's out there that meets your needs hand it to said user who goes away and investigates the um, various manufacturers and comes back and says, okay, I want trials in this. You make sure you get trials in probably two and you set the trials up so they're real. So that you put the, the chairs in the appropriate configuration and you let them run them, okay? Vendors in the room, if a therapist says I need a trial or if a user says I need a trial, giving them an 18 by 18 when they are 16 by 15 is not appropriate. It's worthless. Don't bother. Don't bring them. Okay? Because all that is is showing them a picture. Just as effective. Is that helpful? Then I would say, really, usually, if you're, if you're on with your assessments, but here's the thing. You put them in there, it's horrible. They hate it. You need to do it some more. Right? But if you put them in there, they look good, they're happy, and now it's just like, well, this one's a little heavier. You know, you can sort it out that day. But if you fail, acknowledge it. Right? I mean, if it didn't work the way it's supposed to. And I've done that this many years later. I mean, the first ergo seat uh, that I ordered is in the room, and it was horrible. It was like, well, this is not going to work at all. It's like I can't reach my wheels. It's like, yep, I know, when you're falling over. So even when you think you've done it right, sometimes you're not. Okay, and then you need more time. Other questions? Yes. Comments on chairs for wheelchair basketball and quad rugby and any sport are sport specific. Are sport specific and they are uh, position specific. So on the sport, some sports it depends on what position you play or how you're playing it. Um, I think the rules are exactly the same. The rules are exactly the same. The chair needs to fit the user. If the user has functional, real mobility issues, then you get to deny them the ability to bend that into the position they want to get into because it's where the sport says they should be. In other words, you have to respect their anatomy. If they have real lack of range of motion, you, the therapist, says, this is your option for how you play basketball or whatever. You don't get to put your legs under here. You have to have them in a different position, and then we'll go from there. Okay, so respecting the anatomy is the most important thing, always. Um, and that one's, that one's always, because if you don't respect the anatomy and the angles, you're going to cause skin breakdown, let alone postural problems. Others? With sports, probably one of the things that I think you really need to realize with, with sports, some of those postures are intentionally horrible, right? High 
um, low, low, um, low class rugby, not low class, <laughs> low classified, small numbered <laughs> um, rugby players, <laughs> okay? They will tend to sit in a horrible posterior tilt in order to be stable, in order to have a ball pocket. That is fine for sports, horrible all day position. So you need to be very careful that you don't mirror a daily use chair to a sports chair. You have to think about the difference in function.